let's bow our heads for a moment. Father, as we think about the lessons you have for us, I pray that uh, you would speak to each of our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. The fourth beast of both, well, in, in Daniel 7, it's the fourth beast. In the Daniel 2, it's the fourth kingdom, the legs of iron, represents Rome. And in September, Carol and I took a tour of Europe. We thought about that loosely for a bunch of years, but we were, we were always busy. And now, all of a sudden, we're retired. And I went to a class reunion in Portland a few years ago, and one of my classmates at the class reunion, uh, she and her husband do tours, uh, Reformation history tours of Europe. And so we said, hey, when COVID settles down and you guys do another tour, let us know. So we went on the tour this last September. Uh, it was very inspiring. We saw a lot of places that are important to the history of the Christian church. And we started off in Rome. Rome, that fourth kingdom, took over, according to prophecy, uh, it took over about 168 BC, and it lasted to 476 AD, that fourth kingdom. It was strong, and it was long-lasting. Uh, Rome was a, a formidable uh, power, more so than any of the others before or after in the prophetic sequence. It was stronger and lasted longer. Uh, this is from the... Uh, the myth of the founding of Rome, the, the, the twins Remus and Romulus nursed by a wolf uh, and then they went on to uh, quarrel with each other and one ended up being the founder of Rome. That was Romulus, that's why it's called Rome and not Remus or something else <laughs> because the, Romulus was the brother who uh, survived the quarrel. Daniel 2, it says, the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. That's Rome, the legs of iron. It has unfolded exactly as revealed in Daniel's prophecy. And our tour started there in Rome. Uh, and we had plenty of opportunity during our tour to remember that there is a great conflict going on between God and Lucifer. And it has man, had many rounds, many of which the devil appeared to win at the moment. <laughs> but never does the devil win. It only is a temporary thing when he gains the upper hand. Uh, God allows his enemies some room to prove who they are, among other things. Rome ruled for over 600 years, uh, Daniel 7 says, and, at, and after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, uh, iron teeth, brass nails. Uh, he didn't even have a name for the beast. We are not sure what animal he saw, but it was terrifying and awesome and strong and powerful. It represented Rome. Rome is a very old city. Uh, it rose to power as prophesied about 2,000 years ago, actually more than 2,000 years ago. Uh, these are some of the walls of Rome, the old walls. Uh, this is probably the third century AD wall, but there were earlier walls from about the fourth century BC. Uh, here's a gate, one of the old gates of the city and our group walking through there. Uh, we also visited the Colosseum, probably one of the most famous places in Rome. It's also very large. It would seat uh, 50 to 75,000 people in there. And, and the, the name amphitheater, amphi means two, and theater is a theater. So you take a theater with a a curved seating area, and you take two of them and you put them together, and you get this full round stadium, the Amphi Theater. Two theaters stuck together in a, in a full. Uh, there are rings of support arches uh, at, at higher and higher as you get further out from the center. 
uh, that supported the, the seating area. And a little bit of that has been restored. You can kind of see on the left side here, the bricks are nice and clean and even. That's a restored section. Uh, this is the general condition inside. You see it's uh, quite deteriorated, although the basic structure is still there. Right in the center in front uh, was a, a floor level on top of what you see as the basement passages there. And they kept wild animals down in the basement area as part of the games. Uh, they, they could add a, a wild animal now and then. A section of the seating has been partially restored. The white stones would be basically the original, uh, probably marble. Uh, and then there's stairways that go up and down to access the different levels and the different sections of the seating there. Out the arch here, you see the road in the background. That's the road coming into Rome where the triumphal return from a victorious battle would be celebrated as the, the general or the king enters back into the city. That's the road they would come in on. And just a little further to the right, there is a triumphal arch right there. Uh, and behind to the left, you see a building up on the top of a hill. That's one of the seven hills of Rome. In the days when Revelation was written, the original seven hills were all inside the original wall. And they had not built the later wall. That came about 2300 AD the outer wall. And all of this original seven hills were inside the walls, uh, and they're not huge hills. The, the city was uh, about a thousand acres, so about one and a half square miles inside the walls, and the walls were about seven miles of length to the walls. And so they are modest hills, but those are the seven hills of Rome. And I think we walked on several of them while we were there without me ever realizing I was on one of the seven hills of Rome. Afterward, thinking back over, it's like, oh, ding, that was a little high, wasn't it? That was one of the seven hills. I'll bet it was. Uh, and then some of them reading later, I've discovered, oh, yeah, that was one of them too. Some of the original marble pavement uh, under Carol's feet there, uh, most of that original stones, the, the more valuable stones, have been repurposed somewhere else. Uh, but there is still a little bit here and there that shows you what it was like. It was, it was a pretty splendid place, actually. The gladiators would fight with each other or with wild animals. Our, our tour guide showed us it wasn't just gladiators. I, I thought everybody who fought there was a gladiator. No, a gladiator is one particular kind of fighter. They have a short sword called a gladius and a shield. Uh, another guy has a long pike and a net. You use the net to throw on the other guy. And then, yeah. um, they had different kinds of weaponry, and, and they would mix and match, and who, who knows how they did all of that. Often the fighters were current or former slaves, and sometimes they would fight with each other, sometimes with wild animals, sometimes people who were convicted and to be executed would not be given any weaponry and would be tossed in for the wild animals to feed on. Pagan Rome persecuted Christians off and on for the first 300 years of Christianity. Uh, and the on times were pretty intense. The off times were not always great times, but the persecution was less intense uh, during some of those times. So the participants in, in these uh, fights at the, uh, at the Colosseum would enter at the far end. There's a, a gateway there. And just below us, you see a, a white pathway that's been uh, partially restored on this end. Uh, when the fight was over, the, the victors would exit on the far end where they all came in. The floor was covered with sand because that absorbs blood. Uh, and the losers would be carried out on the close end and buried. Uh, it, it was not good to lose. No, it was built in to the, the system of their, of their games. Um, and uh, we don't do that, but some of our sports do tend 
toward the glorification of violence and, and uh, hostility and, and anger and some of that. And, and uh, you know, we ought to think a bit about what that's doing to us because it's not positive. Um, some of our politicians seem to enjoy causing suffering to people they don't like. Uh, they, they routinely did that back in Rome, uh, and it wasn't pretty. Uh, watching human beings suffer or die for entertainment is incompatible with the ways of heaven. And you see that when you're there. And when you're walking through there, you know Christians died here. Glad it's not happening there right now. But scripture tells us that what the beast, the fourth beast did, will return to our world, including this country. The, the beast with the lamb-like horns that starts out with good principles. I, I always used to think it said, will speak like a dragon future. Uh, it actually says was speaking. Always had some of the voice of the dragon. Uh, and, and if you think about it through the history of our country there's always been some people on the wrong side of the feelings of the country who, who understood what it was to hear the dragon's voice from the one we saw as having lamb-like horns. But the principles of the country are good. That's the lamb-like horns. Our practice isn't always up to our principles. And uh, according to prophecy, that, that disconnect between the principles and the practice is going to become much and more, much more startling in, in the future. The arena floor was accessed from the lower level by an elevator, you see the yellow line there? That kind of outlines where there was a, a, they have restored the elevator system there. By a system of ropes, you could pull a, a, a cage for animals up, and then there's a trap door that's been let down, so that forms a ramp up to the arena floor. So you could open the cage door, open the trap door, the animal walks up the ramp, and joins the fight up there. They had 36 of these trap doors scattered around the arena floor. And in the middle of a gladiatorial fight, they might throw in a lion, just to see what happens. Uh, I suppose it made it more exciting, if you're into that. Uh, but I'm thinking, no, not, not what we ought to be doing. This is a painting on one of the archways uh, in the structure of the, of the Colosseum. Do you see the crucifixions on the left there? How many crosses do you see? And I said, ah, I know what that's talking about. But then if you look closer, what do you see on the ground right in front of the other three? A fourth one. This is actually not about Jesus in Jerusalem. This is about routine executions in Rome. Did it all the time. Plenty of them. Not just a few. Uh, it was an ongoing thing. That was one of the standard methods of, of execution in Rome was crucifixion. Rome, that fourth beast of Daniel 7, the, the devil used Ro Rome through its agent Herod to try to kill baby Jesus. And it comes out in the prophecy in, in Revelation when the dragon tries to consume the son as soon as he's born. Uh, that's, that's Herod, agent of Rome. Uh, the devil later used Rome's uh, direct governor, uh, Pilate, to crucify Jesus uh, and kill him. Uh, Rome was used by the devil to accomplish his purposes. Uh, and uh, pagan Rome was was generally pretty willing to go along with the devil's ideas of, of what they would do. This is the Circus Maximus, actually, a corner of it. It's near the Colosseum. It seated about 150,000 people. It was a chariot racing track. Uh, the racetrack moves off to the upper left from what you're seeing. The tower right there uh, is actually not part of it. I thought, oh, man, the announcer's tower. 
Well, they didn't have radio. They didn't have all that kind of stuff. That's actually a fortification from the Middle Ages, which was quite unrelated to the original purpose of the, of the uh, racetrack. Uh, the imperial palace is just behind the tower on the right. That's the ruins of the imperial tower. And that's one of the hills of Rome, uh, the lower portion of it right there where the, where the palace is, called the Palatine Hill. Many Christians were martyred at circus events, at the races, at these race tracks. And there were more than one race track in Rome. When you visit in pagan Rome, you can see that when a secular state power decides to enforce religious concepts, it always ends in persecution. Always ends in persecution. Pagan Rome was an example of that. It certainly did. This is the remains of the grandstand area there at the Circus Maximus. Uh, chariot racing was a big deal for many centuries in Rome. Uh, there were four teams. The red, the white, the blue, and the green. I thought, oh, that's pretty easy. Red, white, and blue, add green. Uh, but later, it, it, it narrowed down. They lost a couple teams that, that quit participating, and it narrowed down to just the blues and greens. And in those days, from the stands, the spectators would throw things at the participants. And if it was a participant you didn't like, you might throw deadly things at them. It was part of the sport. Like, what's with that? That was, that was part of the way the thing went. Crashes were frequent. In order to be fast, the chariots were built very light, so they broke very easily. And it was not uncommon for the charioteer to be drugged by the reins when the chariot shattered, uh, and uh, might be the end. Often deadly. The greatest charioteer of the ancient world, and, oh, uh, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> Can you tell me who's the highest paid athlete in the United States right now? I actually don't know. Anybody know? A baseball player just got like a $100 million contract or something like that? Okay, okay. This charioteer, Gaius Apuleius Diocles, he won 1,462 races out of 4,257 that he was in. And if you convert it to today's money, he earned $29 billion. Billion dollars. The wealthiest sportsman ever in the history of the world. A chariot racer. It was a big deal. It was a big deal. Now, across town, over by the Vatican, where the Vatican now is, there was another circus. It, it has been called the Circus of Nero, although he didn't build it. He, he did own it at one point. Uh, and here is a map of St. Peter's Basilica and St. Peter's Square. Now, the, the, the basilica and the square are laying sideways on the map. And, and to your left, the dark, the, the light gray area, that's the building, the basilica. And then there's kind of a keyhole shape in white. That's St. Peter's Square out in front. See the green lines? The green lines is where the chariot racetrack was, okay, in, in ancient times. So it, it was over under part of where St. Peter's is and part of where St. Peter's Square are. And you see the yellow circle now? That's where St. Peter's grave was, right beside that circus. There's a reason why he was buried there. Here's a list of Roman emperors. Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Galba, Otto, and Aulus. Augustus, we have him in scripture. Luke 2, verse 1. It came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And it goes on to explain that as a result of that, Joseph and Mary go down to Bethlehem to be registered, and that's why Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Not in Nazareth where they were living, but in the hometown of Joseph, Bethlehem, as the prophecy knew and predicted. 
And then in Luke 3, Tiberius. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, that's when Jesus came to John to be baptized. And he began his ministry. John was uh, at the height of his ministry under the, the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Now the third guy there, Caligula, is the one that started this other circus racetrack. He began building it, uh, and his relative Claudius uh, picked up on that. Uh, and Claudius, uh, his name comes up twice in, in Acts, Acts 11, verse 28. It talks about Agabus, who was a prophet in the church, who showed that there was going to be a great famine, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. So he just happens to be the ruler at the time this famine came along. Chapter 18, verse 2, when Paul gets to Corinth, he finds Aquila and Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. That's how come Aquila and Priscilla were in Corinth when Paul went to Corinth. They'd been evicted, uh, they'd been banished from Rome because they were Jewish. So the Circus of Nero was started by Caligula, uh, and it was finished by Claudius. It was a private track that belonged to their family, and they were in the, the ruling line. When Nero came along, he made it public, no longer private, because he wanted to be cheered as he raced. A little adulation, maybe a little narcissism there. Nobody would ever play to the crowd. We see it. It happens here too. Uh, Caligula liked chariot racing, and when he was building the circus, he brought an obelisk from Egypt and set it up in the middle of, of the racetrack out in the center. They, they call that center part the divider there. They call that the spine, the backbone of, of the racetrack. And that obelisk remained standing there until the 1600s or 1500s when it was moved to the center of St. Peter's Square where it stands today. That, that, that same obelisk stands there. That was when they took down the old St. Peter's Basilica built by, by Constantine and built a new one paid for by indulgences and tetzel. Uh, Nero liked to race and he did not like to lose there was a time that he fell out of the chariot and had to be loaded back in he did not complete the race but he still won <laughs> it is good to be the emperor said the article I was reading <laughs> it's good to be you don't have to actually cross the finish line just be the emperor uh, yeah, you probably don't want to win against the emperor. You know, might be a bad taste to that somewhere. Uh, this circus was the site of the first organized state-sponsored mass execution of Christians by Nero in 8065, after the big fire in Rome. Some people have said Nero probably started the fire. Uh, other historians have said, well, he probably didn't start it, but he was very eager to make big improvements on the part of the city that had burned, and he made it sound like he liked what happened. So people said, ooh, you think? Maybe he did it. Uh, and, and so the, the, the story has come down that he did it. We don't really know that he did or didn't. Uh, but at that moment, Christianity was rising. And it was a thing that was not under the control of the emperor. Which means that Nero and any other emperor would feel threatened by it. And he was looking for excuses to put it down and try to make it go away. And so mass executions of Christians for starting the fire, which they never did. Not, not even accidentally. <laughs> it wasn't them. But it was a good excuse. And so mass executions at this circus uh, under Nero occurred. Uh, Peter was martyred right along where you see the red line down the spine of this circus. 
And the records we have say along the spine between the turning posts. You see the post at the end? The turning post? We know where Peter died. As he hung upside down, he could look at that obelisk that Caligula put up, which we can see in St. Peter's Square. It's still there. Paul may well have been martyred here as well. Constantine built the old St. Peter's Basilica over Peter's grave, and some of the remains of this circus building were still there right up until the time they put the new St. Peter's up in the days of the Reformation in the 1500s. Genesis 16.3, God's explaining to Noah about the flood that's coming, and he says, because the earth is filled with violence. The violence is not God's way, but it was the way in Rome. And according to scripture, we expect that to return. It will come back. We'll see it again. This is the Roman Forum, the center of the city's functions. Uh, there were a number of buildings in the area, the government uh, uh, buildings, uh, and, and it, was, it was where the, the business of the city would occur. This is standing on one of those hills of Rome, looking across the Forum area to one of the other hills of Rome. Don't know the names of these two. I, I, I couldn't figure it out on my map. I don't even know where I was standing when I took the picture. That might be part of it. Uh, but uh, that's some of the hills of Rome. This is the, the Appian Way, the road coming into Rome. You can see a little bit of the wall and the Tower of Rome right ahead of us on the right-hand side. Um, this is the road that Paul came along when he was first brought to Rome as a prisoner. Acts tells us in Acts 28.15. He came along the Appian Way. That road is still there. Uh, we can drive on it now. It's been paved, but it's still the Appian Way. The Mamertine prison is where Paul was kept before he was beheaded. Anybody any good at reading Latin or Italian? Up at the top there, it says, Prigione Dei SS, Apostoli Pietro e Paolo. What'd that say? Peter and Paul. The prison of the saints, the apostles, Peter and Paul. Now we knew that Paul was imprisoned if not here, somewhere close. But uh, tradition has that they were both imprisoned here. And when I first heard that, I thought, huh, I wonder when Peter was here. This, this is the access hole down to the dungeon below. Uh, you're kind of at a basement level, looking down into the sub-basement dungeon level. That's a, not a really big hole. Uh, you can see by the feet around that you're going to put your feet together and you're going to kind of put your arms by your side and they're going to squeeze you down through this little hole. It's not a big hole that they let you up and down. This is the dungeon down below. Uh, it doesn't give you a, a real great size of the height, but uh, you cannot reach the top uh, from standing inside. And it was where prisoners were held when they had been sent to Rome for execution. Um, most prisoners were not held in a prison. You either have your case adjudicated and you're released, or you're penalized in some other fashion, or you're executed. We don't keep you in prison. We, we, we finish off the, the case and, and move you out of the legal system shortly. Uh, and the ones who were up for execution were, were kept in this prison. So here you can see, on the left is Peter. You see that he's holding a couple of keys in his hand? So in Rome, Peter is always shown holding the keys because of the text that says, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom. And then Paul is holding a sword. That's because Paul was beheaded. And so the statues of the martyrs around Rome often will have something that shows you how they died. Uh, and so Paul always is shown with a, a, a sword. Uh, a significant number of our ancient sources say that 
they were imprisoned together and executed on the same day. Not just held together, but executed on the same day. Uh, there are other sources that say other things, but the, but the biggest group of sources agree on them being imprisoned together and executed on the same day. That, that is the, the, not the majority of the sources, but the largest group of, of, of sources. Uh, Peter being a foreigner was crucified. Paul being a Roman was beheaded. This is the Latin gate just inside the memorial chapel to St. John. Uh, here's the little chapel just inside. The chapel of St. John in oil. Here's the sign. Oratorio de San Giovanni in olio. You recognize the olio as a root that kind of connects with oil. This is the chapel of San Giovanni, St. John in oil. By the gate, the Latin gate. Something close to that anyway. Just inside, uh, a picture of what's there and a painting of John being put into the boiling oil. But he was not harmed by it. It should have killed him. But it didn't. So he was later exiled to the island of Patmos. If you can't kill him, you can isolate him. And while he was there, uh, Jesus gave him the visions that were written down in the book of Revelation for us. Uh, and I can see that I have many more slides than time. So we're going to have to uh, shorten this off. Let me show you one more round here. This is the Arch of Titus that celebrates his conquest of Jerusalem in AD 70. Actually built by his brother, who was emperor before Titus later became emperor. Uh, on the right side, we see the four-horse chariot of the triumphal march back into Rome with Titus riding in the chariot. On the left side, you see treasures from the temple in Jerusalem, including the golden lampstand and the golden reflector plates that would have shined that light around within. Wealth taken from Jerusalem when Titus conquered Jerusalem, especially from the temple, was used to help pay for the building of the Colosseum in Rome. Great ultimate use of the money donated for sacred causes. Huh? Not so good, not so good. Uh, but uh, as we look back, there are a lot of Christians who died early in, in, in the Roman Empire. Uh, I was going to show you some of them. I think I won't. Uh, but uh, Bartholomew is, is shown with a copy of his face draped over his arm. Because he was skinned. Uh, and, and, and Philip is shown with a little cross behind him. Because he was crucified. Uh, Paul is always shown with a sword because he was beheaded. In a lot of different ways to uh, execute people. Who didn't knuckle under. When the devil's agent said this is what you will do or else. God's faithful people said, I'll take the or else. Because I know that my Redeemer lives. Amen. And he will stand on this earth. And in my flesh, I will see him. Amen. In my life, I have often thought, what is taking so long? What is taking so long? The, the prophecies are, 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 are fulfilling, but the, the final ones just aren't here. And... Uh, If you're alert to it, it's beginning to happen. If you watch for it, you can see it. If you listen for it, you can hear that dragon's voice. If you watch for it, you can see the spirit 
of hostile, antagonistic oppression. Here. Now. In our country. Don't get sucked in. Don't get sucked in. Father, we thank you that you have always been faithful to your people in all times of history. And we thank you for the promise that you will be that again and continue to be for us in the days ahead as well. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.